Well, wasn't that fancy. Bet you didn't think a Spectrum could do that, did you? I mean, look, scrolling background and everything. Want to see how it works? Stick around and I'll explain. If you want actual code, there's a link on my GitHub and a write-up on my website, link below, wherever, up here or down there somewhere. Go have fun with it, then come back and tell me what you made. Stick it in the comments or something, find me on Twitter. If you make something, I'm quite interested in knowing what you've done. So the Spectrum then. The next, it's an 8-bit computer. They're not supposed to do these things. They're slow, poor graphics, and this stuff is normally available to machines like the Amiga. In fact, these effects are pretty common to Amiga users and kind of unimpressive. So if you're thinking, yeah, my Amiga can do that in a window, whilst formatting a disk, or you're a modern programmer and thinking, yeah, that's quite a fun effect, let's show you what some shaders can do. Well, remember this machine is running on a 3 MHz CPU with 64K of addressable RAM. It's not supposed to do this. Well, it is because it was designed to. And that's what this video is about. How to make something called the copper in the Spectrum Next, which is just down here, do some fancy effects. I'm not going to bore you with intense code reviews. I'd rather show an overview of what's going on so you understand it. Then you can go look at the code on your own time on my GitHub and just kind of absorb the details yourself. If you've watched demos from machines such as the Amiga, you've no doubt seen pretty coloured bars bouncing up and down the screen. Buried inside the Amiga's architecture is a chip known as Agnus, which is responsible for many functions of the machine that are synchronised to the video beam making the screen. One of its functions is known as the copper, and it's responsible for those colourful bars on the screen. That's not all it does, and I'm sure it wasn't really intended for doing that, but this copper thing lets us do some quite extraordinary things to the machine. It's called copper because it's a sort of contraction of coprocessor, you see, old machines weren't actually that powerful, so to get anything exciting out of them required extra custom circuitry. Now, why do we care about Amigas when this is about the Spectrum next? Well, the designers of our modern Specky possibly were ex-Amiga owners, and they saw fit to give us a copper to play with as well. Now, not only do we get hardware sprites and a nice high-colour display, but they managed to jam in some fun effects for us to play with as well. It's pretty cool, this stuff. If you've ever read the book Racing the Beam and thought it sounded pretty cool being able to control hardware so precisely we can decide what the electron beam is producing while it's producing it, well the copper lets us do that to a certain extent. You are literally running code as the beam is scanning across the screen, that's how this all works. If the next was made from actual chips rather than an FPGA, you can imagine the copper as being a separate chip, or maybe part of the video and memory circuitry. Either way, it's separate to the CPU, so the CPU doesn't get involved with any of this. Also, the copper runs at 28 megahertz, no matter what the CPU is set to. And it's synchronized to the display and knows exactly where the electron beam is all the time. LCDs don't have electron beams, but that's how video is generated. Top to bottom, left to right, with little gaps at the side and bottom to allow this non-existent electron beam to physically move across the screen. So yeah, even your fancy HDMI display that you use to watch Netflix is still doing the same thing and pretending to be a dumb analogue TV from the 1960s that needed time for this electron beam to actually move. And we can feed this copper a list of instructions and it'll perform them for us very precisely. So let's look at how to do that, recreating some popular effects. Our little 8-bit computer is capable of things 16-bit machines can do, and it doesn't even break a sweat doing it. Your TV might do, though, depending on how relaxed it is about video timings. I'll say more on that later. I made my TV, this one, emit some quite sad noises whilst learning how to do this. It was pretty funny. I wish I'd actually recorded it. This is maybe a good time to remind you that if you don't have a Next, and you're a bit grumpy that the release has been delayed, this will also work using emulators or clone boards. And in fact, unless you like creating overly complex development systems, like the one I've got here, an emulator is an efficient way to test your code. You can boot it and reset it really quickly. So there's no need to miss out. So the copper needs programming using its own set of instructions. It's a state machine though, not an actual processor. 
So all we're able to do is feed it a sequence of steps to work through. In fact, there's only four instructions the copper knows. One of those is no op, which literally does nothing. And another is halt, which does exactly what it says. So the two you need to know are just wait, which waits for a scanline position, and then move, which sets a next register to a specific hard-coded value. By themselves, these instructions seem almost primitive as to be completely useless. There's no concept of looping, there's no branching, and you can forget about using variables as you can't read and write to system RAM. However, we can use the copper to direct other parts of the machine to do our bidding on a per scanline basis. This is our code running per scanline rather than per frame. And once you get this concept, it's pretty cool. We get to do that really cool race in the beam stuff where the screen data is produced as it's being put on the display. Now, programming the copper requires a special kind of lateral thinking. It's best to sit down with the manual, look at all the next registers, and try to work out what would happen if you could change them per scanline. It's called the copper, but graphical effects aren't the limit of its abilities. Let's look at the effect that gave copper bars their name. Over in Amiga land, they were these colourful horizontal bars that went across the width of the screen. For bonus marks, we'll draw them in the screen border too, because that was quite difficult to do apparently. It's easy for us. Yes, we can put things in the screen border actually, that bit of the screen that's normally out of bounds, where you can only set its colour. It's that annoying big band that, as a kid, I really used to hate it. It was like looking through a letterbox at my image. I just didn't understand why it was there. Now, I know, I know the next can put sprites in there, and layer 2 can also extend into it, but that's modern trickery. I mean, the copper is modern trickery too, but the thing we're playing with now is not just composited on top of the old Spectrum display. We are actually playing with the ULA's own display now by doing this. So the border is generated by the basic Spectrum video hardware that's still in the machine. And the copper lets us bugger about with it, um, and it's not a modern extension of the display. The code for this is on my GitHub, and I've explained it on my website in more detail as well, and the links are down in the bottom, as I keep telling you. Hopefully you'll click them. I'll go over the concept here rather than a line by line explanation. So hopefully your eyes won't glaze over completely. You won't look like one of my students when I start trying to over explain something to them. So like I said, the copper's got no ability to do anything other than set next registers to specific hard coded values. The next has got no registers that will draw anything on the screen. So we need to use a trick. I mean, all we can do is set the border to a specific color because that's all the hardware is capable of doing. But if we can set the border a color at different horizontal locations, we can make stripes. Do you see where I'm going with this? There's a catch though, because there always is. The screen border's color isn't a Spectrum Next register. We can't change it directly. However, the ULA's color palette has a next register associated with it, or it's got a few actually. So you might see where this is going. We can remap colors through the next register system, and to make stripes on the border, all we need is some way to set the border to a known color, wait for a specific scan line on the screen, remap the border to a color we want, and then wait for the scan line to stop. We then remap the border color to what it was originally, or a new color, and then rinse and repeat. This idea is kind of what copper and screen programming is all about. On a per frame basis, the screen is a single unit. The border can only be one color, but once a given scan line has been drawn, it won't change for the rest of that frame. So if we start telling the next to do something else, it'll happily follow along. And because the copper is in sync with the screen drawing, we don't have to manually count sync pulses or have precise timers to do any of this, which is what you used to do on other machines where the display was not as synchronized as this one is. If that's not fancy enough, the proper clever part is that the next isn't drawing anything. All it's doing is remapping the color of the background while the the electron beam, which doesn't exist on this machine, is drawing the screen and just going over that area of the screen. The code is changing a few bytes in video memory. No pixels have been harmed in this effect. And since we're not drawing pixels, this happens incredibly quickly. Like, this is a 3 MHz machine, it shouldn't be happening this quickly, quick.
Yeah, I know. The copper runs at 28 megahertz because the documentation says it does. And the screen updates at 50 or 60 hertz or thereabouts. And the CPU isn't doing a lot. But come on, even the ST found this kind of thing difficult. There's demo effects that will consume all the machine's resources. And then there's one you could actually slip into a game. You know, some of the demo effects that you see, the machine is working flat out to do that. And you could never do anything else that have actual gameplay. This, though, with the copper bars, is in the second category, as you'll see in a bit. We have plenty of CPU time to actually play a game with this. Now, these lists of copper instructions get long, like tediously long, and there's no way to make them shorter. So if you want 100 colored bars on the screen, you need to type out the code to make each of those 100 bars show up. And you can't automate this. You could make maybe the Spectrum, when it boots up, pre-generate this code for you. That's one way of doing it. But there's no way you can tell the copper to loop something. So hopefully by now you've seen this is not hard to do. It just gets a bit tedious. Like in one of the demos I was going to show off, I was going to try and write some text in the border. But the copper list required to do this would have been too long, and then I got bored. You see, one scan line is broken up into 8 pixel segments, so the copper can actually do things mid-scan line, and I bet with some effort it'd be possible to write something like Pong using just the copper to create the image. Not quite sure how the ball would move, but you could definitely draw the paddles and stuff. So if you can work out how, and have the perseverance to try and draw basic blocky text in the border, let me know in the comments. A vertical text scroller in the border would be pretty fun. I think you could have a lot of fun with this if you start thinking creatively. Something weird I noticed with my code is it made my TV go a bit strange. It blanked the image and looked like it was having issues locking onto the signal. Now, this is something to do with the HDMI splitter that I'm using. If I just unplug it, I trace it down to this thing. It's one of those cheap little Chinese HDMI splitters, okay? It takes video signal, splits it into two things. I use it so that I can see what I'm doing whilst developing, but then also capture it to my PC to make videos. And I think it's got like sync issues if the signal isn't spot on 60 hertz. Now, as you experiment with programming the hardware at this level, if you do it wrong, quite weird things will happen. Like, I managed to make it draw lots of random patterns in the border, just sort of all around this bit where there's not normally a signal. And my TV emitted this really high pitched, weird wailing noise. Debugging that was pretty difficult because it's all timing sensitive. So, my technique is to try and break things down to small pieces. If you're drawing a bar down the screen and it just like randomly moves, try and break it down so it's just drawing the bar and then try and make it move separately. So you at least know whether it's working or not. And like, if you refactor your code because it's getting a mess, you might suddenly find everything's broken because you've maybe moved something and not realized. You can often be sat there wondering, why is the screen green and the bottom border flickering and I've not used green at all in my code? You know, it's a bit random, but it's part of the fun. And you can boot the next up pretty quickly. And we're not using tapes anymore. So editing and debugging is quite a short thing. It took me ages to figure all this stuff out. And that was with help from other people's sample code. So, you know, persevere. You'll eventually figure it out. Hopefully my code's useful to you. Now, pretty borders is one thing. But beyond showing off, it's not that useful. Another popular effect in old games was to make the background scroll at different speeds to give the illusion of depth and that you know, the player is doing something more than just being on a black screen. And this has actual practical use. Many shoot 'em up games had a slowly scrolling background image that was there to give the impression the player was flying somewhere. It was one of the defining things of 16-bit computers. The background of your games was something other than black. If you look at a lot of Spectrum games, the background is just black. Well, with our next and some copper code, we can make it fancy. Platform games had backgrounds that gave the same effect and a foreground that scrolled at different rates for some fun parallax effects, just to add that little extra bit of realism and polish to these games. Now doing this is a bit more complex than merely drawing on the borders. There are next registers to scroll the screen, so we can move it, 
but they need telling precisely how far the screen needs to scroll. This needs calculating every frame, except there's no copper command to do maths, store variables or read data. And the copper can only write specific bytes to next registers. So we can't tell the screen just to move left one pixel each frame or each scan line. We need to tell it to move it a specific number. So again, we need a trick. And that trick is we need to upload new commands to the copper while it's running. So we're getting into sort of self modifying code in a way. The post on my website and the sample code explains this easier than I could do here. So go and have a look. There's two ways to do it depending on how much code needs uploading and changing. And I explain both of them. Now moving parts of the screen requires it to be organized appropriately. The next doesn't have the concept of overlapping or multiple graphical layers. You've got sprites, you've got tiles, and you've got one background layer. So you can't have like the if you look on the example code, you can't have the mountains scrolling with clouds scrolling across the top of the mountains, covering them up. Because all you're really doing is cutting the screen up into pieces and sliding those pieces next to each other. So you've got to sort of organize your screen and decide what you're going to do. You can change the priority of colors, but I've not got that far yet to figure it out. And my next thing is to figure out the tile system. So that I can maybe have a scrolling background and a tile and then a character. I've been learning about the copper for drawing things on the screen because it makes quite interesting content. I bet I lost 90% of my viewers once the pretty pattern stopped and I started talking. I mean, I'm used to it in my day job though, so it's fine. I'm not gonna lose any sleep over it. If you got this far, however, you are the kind of person I'm making this video for. And I actually hope you do find it useful or at least vaguely entertaining. Actually, if you did, give it a like so that we can play that YouTube popularity game. If you like it, the YouTube overlords increase the chances of showing this video to other people like you, and so on, and it helps grow my channel. Also, if you found this by chance, hit subscribe if you think it's worth coming back, that'd be cool. So yeah, anyway, the point of all this is I'm trying to show that if you've got some understanding of C, you can read documentation, and you're not afraid to give it a go, this stuff is quite accessible. We might be programming an 80s computer, but the knowledge isn't trapped in disconnected bulletin boards or random text files like it used to be. Next time, I'll explain how the memory banking and DMA works. They're techniques that let us get beyond this pretty irritating 64K address space limit that our 8-bit CPU's got. You know, the next has got a meg of RAM, but the CPU can only get 64K of chunks of it, so I'll learn how to juggle that. If you manage to make anything with this code, let me know either down below in the comments bit or find me on social media. I'm curious what you can do with it. And until next time, goodbye. I don't care if Adobe needs updating. Be using you later. Hello, Creative Cloud has been updated again. It was done yesterday. We finished? Can I get on?